Welcome back, boxing fans. Obviously, this has been a slow weekend of boxing, <laughs> but a big weekend of NCAA college basketball. If you're a big fan of college basketball, you can go check out my other channel, Sean on Ball uh, on YouTube, and chop it up. Tell me what you think about my brackets, which are not looking too good right now. Obviously, me picking Kentucky to go all the way was not a good move, but hindsight is 2020. But jump on in, say hello, and we can talk about basketball. Obviously, college basketball now, NBA coming up down the road. Um, so we've seen a lot of the conversation going on recently regarding David Benavidez and Canelo Alvarez. Obviously, the Canelo Alvarez boo birds who have consistently been anti everything Canelo Alvarez has done, going back to when obviously he fought Floyd Mayweather and everything he's done since then, even though he's done a lot since then. And just the fact that he did fight Floyd Mayweather when he was 24 years old or whatever it was, that's also a big statement, right? It gives you some indication of what level of opposition he's been in with his whole career. When we talk about guys like Trout, Floyd, Mosley, even though obviously Mosley was past his best, Cotto, uh, Lara, Golovkin, uh, Kovalev, Smith, Saunders, Plant, Bivol. I, I mean, it's easy to say that currently in boxing, there's only one fighter that truly has a great resume, and that is Canelo Alvarez. Whether you like him or whether you dislike him, I mean, that's up to you. I mean, I'm not here to try to convince you to like someone. I've stated on multiple uh, videos that I'm not a big Canelo Alvarez fan. Stylistically, I'm not a big fan of his. And obviously, I was a Golovkin fan, right? So, you know, uh, my ball was in the Golovkin camp. I was never a Canelo Alvarez fan. But when you see all this negative narrative that gets pushed out constantly on YouTube, uh, I just feel like it has to be addressed. The reality is the level of expectations people have for Canelo Alvarez is way above anybody else in sports. If we just make a simple comparison between uh, Canelo Alvarez. Sorry, uh, I just wonder why I'm not in the middle. Um, Canelo Alvarez and Tank Davis. The reason I bring these two fighters up is because many PBC fans talk about how Tank Davis is the face of boxing in America. So by saying that, now you're putting him into the conversation to be compared with Canelo Alvarez. Yet when you compare what they've done, there's no comparison. Golovkin, oh sorry, Tank Davis is currently 30 years old. Canelo is 34. He's only four years older, but yet he's a four-way world champion. Legitimate four-way world champion. Tank Davis is now currently a two-way world champion. His most recent weight class was a, an email title given to him because Devin Haney moved up and vacated his WBA title, allowing the WBA to elevate regular champion, in this case Tank Davis, to become the super champion. So you got one guy who's got twice as many levels as far as weight classes, right? Uh, Canelo Alvarez has been a unified champion at 154 pounds. He's been a unified champion at 160 pounds. He's been a unified champion at 168 pounds, an undisputed unified champion. Tank Davis has never unified titles at either one of these two weight classes not 130 or 135, right? So there's a clear difference and discrepancy between what these two fighters have actually done in the ring, who they've beaten, and how some people hold Canelo to these outrageous expectations will allow Tank Davis <clears throat> the full opportunity to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, against whomever he wants. Now he is going to be fighting Frank Martin, and people are really excited about the possibility of a Frank Martin world title fight on pay-per-view. But yet people talk about Jaime Munguia being a cherry pick. Jaime Munguia uh, has a far more credible resume and accolades than Frank Martin. He's younger. He was an ex-world champion. He's been in with elite-level fighters. 
whereas Frank Martin has never fought a top 10, 135 pound fighter. Frank Martin might be better, and I'm not saying he isn't, but the reality is he's the older fighter who has less accomplishments. Jaime Munguia is coming off of a sensational victory, stopping John Ryder, the same John Ryder that went the distance with Canelo Alvarez. You can't even tell me who Frank Martin's last opponent was. I know you can't. You're going to have to box wreck it because you can't pronounce the German fighter's name. And this isn't me dismissing and downplaying, but you think about here's one guy fighting a dude who's coming off a significant win against a top 10 opponent in a weight division. Here's another guy who once again is fighting someone who hasn't done anything in the division. Every single fighter that Tank Davis has fought at 135 has not been a very accomplished fighter. Not Rolly Romero, not Isaac Cruz, not Gamboa, and now not Frank Martin. And those are the only legitimate 135-pound fighters he's fought since he's been at that weight. Multitudes of other fighters he brought up in weight, and one he brought down in weight. A fighter that is easily the biggest name and the most accomplished fight on his resume, but yet it's against a guy in Ryan Garcia who's never been a world champion. And if Devin Haney goes in there and destroys Ryan Garcia, is that going to make Frank uh, Tank Davis's victory more significant or less significant? You let me know in the comment section below. And, and I'm not trying to criticize and hate on Tank Davis. I'm just pointing out, isn't it funny and ironic that Canelo Alvarez gets all this hate and criticism regardless of who he fights, whereas Tank Davis gets a complete pass? Now the new name that Canelo Alvarez has to face is David Benavides a fighter who was a two-time 168-pound title champion, 168-pound champion, but on both occasions ended up losing his title, once because of drugs and once because of missing weight on the scale. But yet people ignore that and downplay it. So a guy that lost his title because of drugs and then lost his title because he was too fat because he can't easily make 168 pounds, which is why his next fight against Vozdik is at 175. And it's ironic. You imagine any opponent that uh, people are pushing somebody to fight, taking on a Vozdik. Just put this in context. Imagine if Shakur Stevenson or Devin Haney took on a Vozdik level of opponent. Tank Davis fans would ridicule, ridicule and criticize them for fighting a low-level opponent. David Benavides is moving up to 175 and taking a guy who's not even ranked in the top 10 in the weight division. A guy who's come out of four years of retirement and is in his late 30s. But somehow that's going to be a significant victory for David Benavides. More significant than Canelo Alvarez fighting Jaime Manguia, an undefeated prime fighter coming off of a, a fantastic performance. And, and I'm not trying to criticize and hate on David Benavides, but if this is your boogeyman, is this the expectation you have taking on this kind of opponent? An opponent that knockout boxing doesn't even know how to pronounce his name. Yet this guy's been around for a long time. Yet this guy who's a hardcore boxing fan doesn't know how to pronounce Vozdik's name. <laughs> I mean, you know, what does that tell you about this level of opponent? And this guy was hyping up the pay-per-view with Tank Davis versus Frank Martin and David Benavides versus Vozdik. But yet he's not hyping up Canelo Alvarez versus David, uh, sorry, Canelo Alvarez versus uh, Jaime Manguia. And in truth, there's only one of these two cards that's a real pay-per-view, and that's obviously Canelo Alvarez. Why? Because he is the face of boxing. And we're going to easily see that the numbers for Canelo Alvarez's pay-per-view far supersede Tank Davis versus uh, who? Oh, yeah, Frank Martin. With David Benavides on the undercard, this boogeyman, this superstar, a guy whose last two pay-per-views – did less than 200,000 pay-per-view buys against quality opponents in Caleb Plant, who did 700,000 buys with Canelo Alvarez. 
and Demetrius Andrade, who is really just a, a big talking nobody who's never done anything in the sport of boxing and probably going to be getting knocked out by David Morrell on the undercard, right? Which is a pretty good fight. But let's get to this. So we see recently David Benavides, obviously, and his team have been calling out Canelo Alvarez consistently still acting as if the whole reason this fight hasn't happened is strictly because of Canelo Alvarez, even though it's been clear, according to the PBC as well, that they never offered David Benavides as an opponent to Canelo Alvarez, not in their three fight deal that recently Canelo Alvarez walked away from and not obviously currently in the one fight deal that they currently have now with him versus Jaime Manguia. So the question is, who's been pushing David Benavides? Because it apparently hasn't been his manager, Al Heyman, and it hasn't been his uh, promotional team, the PBC. And when you listen to people within his camp, Everybody has a conflicting opinion about exactly what's going on. Now, of course, Canelo Alvarez came out and said that he has no problem facing David Benavides, a guy who's going to come in 25 pounds bigger than him on fight night. Uh, he just wants to be paid accordingly for that fight. So if a promoter comes up and offers him a fair payday, he's more than willing to jump in and face this fighter right away. But the reality is Benavides doesn't bring anything legitimate to the table. And it's true. Does he have a world title right now? No. Is he a pound for pound top 10 fighter in boxing right now? No. I mean, outside of Mike Tyson calling him the Mexican, the Mexican monster, Mexican monster, what else does he have going for him? Some hype created by Mike Tyson, who obviously has a big fan base. Because David Benavidez fan base couldn't blow him up that way. It took Mike Tyson's fan base to actually build him up to being a, a potentially entertaining opponent. But in saying that, it's not that big of a fight or else this would have been one of the main fights the PBC was pushing Canelo Alvarez to have with the PBC. But they weren't. They were looking at two Charlos and Spence. Like le le leg legitimately, that's what they were originally hoping for. The Canelo Alvarez would cross over to the PBC to fight Charlo, Charlo, and then Spence. But unfortunately, Spence got knocked out, so he wasn't a realistic opponent any longer. And Charlo came back, looked like garbage against Benavides' brother. And the other Charlo, who obviously was coming off of a significant win, becoming undisputed champion, uh, and a pound-for-pound -pound top 10 fighter, the kind of guy you felt would really give Canelo Alvarez a challenge, uh, he went in and... and put in a stinker performance, really no ambition at all, which uh, I understand why they walked away from the other Charlo, because a Charlo is a Charlo is a Charlo. The majority of boxing fans don't know the difference between one Charlo and the other. I'm a hardcore boxing fan, but I don't know which one is which as far as their first name. <laughs> really, I don't. I don't. I mean, if I see them, I know which one is the 154 pound one. I know which one's the 168, sorry, 160 pound. Well, now currently 168 pound champ or 168 pound contender. But outside of seeing their face and knowing which is which, I never can remember which one's Jermel and which one's Jermal, Jermel, Mall and Mel, right? E-L-L-A-L-L. -L -L. I don't know which one's which. I guess I could take crib notes and, and write it down so that I would know, but even I don't know. So what do you think casual fans are going to see? If they see him fight Charlo again, they're just going to assume he's doing a rematch with a fighter that came and gave no real integrity or intensity at all in that fight. So it's obviously not going to sell more on pay-per-view. It's going to do less because even less people are going to be inclined to pay attention to that fight. So, of course, the fight that people are asking for is this fight. And it makes sense. Currently, at 168 pounds, the two best fighters really, in most people's opinion, are obviously undisputed champion, Canelo Alvarez, and David Benavides. Okay. 
and being a mandatory and top contender makes you a solid opponent. But the question is, is this the only direction Canelo Alvarez could go? Is this the only potential opponent available to him? Because the reality is we've seen many guys that were contenders, but if the fight wasn't able to, able to generate the kind of money that both fighters wanted to make this fight happen, generally those fights didn't happen, right? And, and this is no difference in this case. People act as if David Benavides is a, a, a monster and, and obviously a huge superstar in boxing, but he's not. We've seen that by his two pay-per-view fights, which did marginal numbers at best, right? The only people really pushing him are people that are anti Canelo Alvarez. There's no real David Benavides fans because a lot of people who are now David Benavides fans at one time were Caleb Plant fans and, and were picking Caleb Plant to beat David Benavides. Right, John? We remember back then when all these PBC dudes were all pro Plant, the white black guy. He's more black than he's white. Is what some of these guys were saying. He got swag like a black guy, right? Literally, this is the kind of racist rhetoric these guys were putting out. And they were very, of course, anti Benavides because he's a Mexican American, a Latino. And these guys generally don't support Latinos. Go look at Bruce Vane, for example. All he does is make racist videos and racist content towards Latino fan base consistently. Why? I don't know why. He's a Flo Mo fan. Uh, and, and lots of Mexicans supported Floyd Mayweather. So I don't know why all of a sudden he's so anti-Latino, but he is, you know, and it's not as if he's pro-black, but he, we know what he is. He just wants controversy because controversy sells on YouTube, right? And, and really that's the truth, the crux behind him as a, as a YouTuber. Let me change that. boxing. <laughs> so question is, is this a fight you want to see or are there other opponents? For me, of course, I want to see this fight, but I also didn't mind a, a Bud Crawford fight or a Jaime Munguia fight. At this point of Canelo's career, like Bud Crawford, you can see that really he just wants the biggest fights available, fights that are going to be huge events. David Benavides is not a huge event, right? For hardcore boxing fans, they're going to be excited about it. But outside of this hardcore fan base, most casual sports fans or casual boxing fans don't really give a fuck, right? And that's the reason why there's not more of a push towards this fight. It's not that Canelo is ducking David Benavides. It's not that Benavides is scared of Canelo. It's just Benavides wants a certain amount of cash he knows being the mandatory wasn't going to get him that. That's why he's never pushed for the mandatory, right? People don't understand that. And it's a shame because if you call yourself a YouTube boxing channel, you should understand the difference between being a mandatory opponent and a guy that forces mandatory. You can be the mandatory opponent, but you're not mandated by the sanctioning body. Once you're mandated, then negotiation has to happen. And once negotiation happens, then there's a percentage already set by the sanctioning body, right? You're not going to get 40% as a David Benavides fighting a Canelo Alvarez, an undisputed 168-pound champion. You'd probably get about 25% of the purse. And maybe if you begged and pleaded, maybe the WBC would push it to 35. Maybe. But... They also don't want to offend Canelo. So chances are probably not. So you're probably going to have to accept 25%. The irony is many people that would be outraged with Canelo Alvarez giving Benavides 25% are the same people that expected Shakur to take 25% to fight Devin Haney. And what did Shakur do? He went to the WBC and said, okay, whatever you direct, that's what I will take. And Devin Haney uh, chose to drop his title instead of being forced to negotiate with the guy that's been mandated as his mandatory. 
showing you they never really had any true uh, inclination to fight Shakur anyway. They were always going to move to 140 to fight Prograce. Them throwing out fake offers to fight Shakur was just that, fake offers, right? As far as Canelo and Benavides, we know there's been no offers and no, no negotiation that's been, been happening at this point because Canelo's team has told you that. They said no promoter has talked to them about making a deal between him and David Benavides. The only person who recently reached out to David Benavides' team was obviously Eddie Hearn. And you saw what happened with regards to that. They said, well, if the Amazon gets American rights for the fight, then they're okay with it. And of course, DAZN was like, what do you mean? If we're going to pay for it, why would we give up TV rights to the U.S.? Of course, we will take TV rights to the U.S. as well because we're the ones paying for the fight. And of course, he said, well, look at uh, Ryan Garcia and Tank Davis. Yeah, the difference is this is not even fucking comparable to Ryan Garcia and Tank Davis. David Benavides is no fucking Ryan Garcia and Tank Davis is no Canelo Alvarez, right? But this is the same kind of rhetoric and narrative we saw people push towards Wilder and AJ negotiation, acting as if AJ offering Wilder anything lower than 50% was somehow ridiculous even though up at that point, Wilder had never even done a pay-per-view. <laughs> but, you know, the uh, fallacies that we see on YouTube, it, it just shows people's real bias and, and fanboyism because they can't be consistent and they can't be honest. Not at all. Uh, so recently, David Benavides came out and said, if Canelo so bad, well, he wants Canelo so bad, he's willing to accept the rehydration clause if Canelo asks for it. So he's, he wants Canelo so bad, yet he didn't force the WBC to make him the mandated WBC mandatory. So how bad do you really want it, right? That, that goes back to the whole purse bid split, uh, telling you that when he was offered 5 million, he's more than happy with that, but they never reached out and negotiated with him. He doesn't care about the money. He just wants to fight. You know, that's, a pure lie and bullshit. It's not true at all. Because the whole reason they want Amazon to have TV rights in the US is so that he gets uh, more upside on the pay-per-view. Him recently reaching out to uh, Turkey Al Sheik is looking for somebody with deep pockets that can fund the fight. Fund the fight, not just for Ken Alvarez, but for him as well. So now he says, he would take the fight with a rehydration clause if Canelo asked for it. So what do you think? Should Canelo make David uh, Benavides take a rehydration clause? Because you know what's going to happen. It's the same stupidity that we see from people that say that uh, Canelo should have fought Bivol at 168. Yet these people would have criticized Canelo for pulling Bivol down to 168. These people will criticize Canelo for making David Benavides fight with a rehydration clause. And ironically enough, these same people were happy that Tank Davis put a rehydration clause on Ryan Garcia. They said that just made it an even playing field. Well, what's the difference in this case? There is no difference. This would just make it an even playing field so that David Benavides wouldn't be 25 pounds heavier than Canelo Alvarez on fight night. Right? But do you think these guys are going to be consistent with their message? Of course they're not. When Andre Ward pulled Dawson down from 175 to 168, were these guys critical of Andre Ward? Not at all. You never heard one of these guys make a video being critical of Ward pulling uh, Dawson down a whole weight division. Not at all. Right? Yet these people cried and complained when Rigo got pulled up two weight divisions to fight Loma. But they failed to talk about how Lomachenko was going to fight Rigo originally at 124 pounds, going down in weight to meet at a catch weight to fight for his 126 pound title with a rehydration clause, meaning he couldn't blow up too big. And yet Rigo turned that contract down. But people ignore that. I mean, because, you know, they, they don't want to fanboy for a fighter that they're opposed to. They only want a fanboy for fighters that they're in bed with, right? In this case, a PBC fighter and David Benavides. This guy is not the A-side. 
but he expects everything to happen for him as if he was the A-side, that Amazon and the PBC is part of the promotional team, that he gets more than 25% of the pot, that he has some sort of say in what happens with regards to this fight. And the truth is, in all three of those cases, he has nothing to say at all. He's an opponent with no world titles, no big fan base, no pay-per-view success behind him. There's nothing that he brings to the table that makes him in a position to negotiate with Canelo Alvarez on equal footing. That's just the reality. If Canelo said 5 million rehydration clause, we're doing it then. There's nothing this guy could say. It's on zone. There it is. Canelo can do that because he is the A-side, just like Floyd Mayweather was the A-side. And people go, well, Floyd Mayweather dropped all this, this, and that when he fought Oscar De La Hoya. Yeah, because at that time, he wasn't the A-side. Oscar De La Hoya was the A-side, right? And then these people go, oh, well, look at Manny Pacquiao, blah, blah, blah. Well, Pacquiao wasn't the A-side. De La Hoya was the A-side too. It's just De La Hoya made bad A-side decisions because he was so greedy and eager to get a Manny Pacquiao fight, which backfired on him. But that had nothing to do with Pacquiao. <laughs> Pacquiao just had his limits and he said, this is it. If you want the fight, okay. If you don't, whatever. I don't need you. He did, but he didn't go into negotiation desperate like David Benavides is. Yet now David Benavides has been giving an out. He's been giving a pass, right? Currently here, we can see the rankings for 168 pounds. This is a packed division with a lot of great opponents. But the reality is risk-reward. David Benavides doesn't want to fight Morel. He doesn't want to fight any of these dangerous guys at 168 because he's not going to get paid big money. It's not going to be a pay-per-view. And the chances are he could lose to somebody that isn't going to make him rich, unlike Canelo Alvarez, right? And a lot of these guys physically are bigger fighters than Canelo Alvarez is because Canelo is not a natural 168-pound fighter. He's a guy that came up from 140, 147. And now, obviously, as he matured and got thicker and grew, grew uh, into the 168-pound division. But at 5'8", a guy that fought Floyd Mayweather at 154, he, he is far from one of the bigger 168-pound champions in boxing or fighters in boxing. Literally, you can go through this list, and every single guy is bigger than him, taller, longer, uh, and more of a natural 168-pound fighter. But now we think about the 175-pound division. This is the new stomping ground for David Benavides, right? Let me just, I want to see this a little bigger. Box rec. You won't see it, but I can see it. My eyes are too small to see that little screen right there. So let me just open up the full computer screen for me to uh, look at and, and discuss the 175 pound weight division. So there we go. So currently, uh, Bivol, Better Bev, Bawatsi Smith. Uh, I don't know how Kalajic is number five. I definitely don't know how Vozdik is number six. Uh, Ali Imanalov, uh, Dan Aziz, Jeremy Pampalone, Lyndon Arthur, Albert Ramirez. This just shows you how weak the 175 pound division is, right? The fact that this level of opposition, a bunch of guys that you and I have never heard of, literally never heard of. The top six guys, I know who they are. But number seven, Dan Aziz, I know who he is. Nine, ten, okay, Lyndon Arthur, I know who he is, but he's not a top ten fighter. Going all the way down to Anthony Yard at number 13, right? This is a UK heavy division, which means that really at the top of the level, these guys probably aren't really that great, right? We saw, of course, what David Benef uh, Arthur Better BF did to Callum Smith, uh, kicking his ass, moving forward to obviously what is a huge fight with Dimitri Bivol. 
Now, obviously, David Benavides jumps into this division, and, and there's a ton of fighters in this division he could fight. Mm -hmm. Yet, unless he goes to the UK to fight them, like a Boazzi, a Smith, or uh, Anthony Yard, you're probably not going to get paid big money for any of these guys, at least not bringing them to the U.S. Right? Smith, uh, Dan Aziz, and, and Anthony Yard are all on a similar level. So if they fight one another, it would be a huge fight in the UK. But for David Benavides, these aren't the kind of fights people are interested in. If he makes those fights, we'd praise him for it. But at the same time, it's not as if these fights are uh, fights that really are going to grab a lot of attention in the US market. They're going to grab no attention. We know he's going to be fighting Vozdik next, who is now currently 20 and 1, 16 KOs, 36 years old, 6'2" with a 75 and a half inch reach. This is a guy who uh, got knocked out by Arthur Berbiev in 2019. Didn't come back to boxing until 2023. Fought a six rounder against a guy who was 20, 34 and two. Then fought uh, a club fighter type of guy in Bolotniks who was 19, six and one. Got rid of him in six rounds. And then in his last fight, he just fought Isaac uh, Rodriguez, 28 and four, stopped him in two rounds. Uh, two of these fights that he faced have been in the US. One was in Mexico uh, on, I think, the Ken Alvarez undercard. This guy, Isaac Rodriguez, five losses, Brazilian fighter, 39 years of age, knocked out four times in five losses, 22 knockouts and 28 wins. But yet, who has he fought? He'd literally just been beaten in his previous fight to Richard Rivera before fighting uh, Alexander Vozdik. Prior to that, he fought a guy who was 10, 23, and 4. Prior to that, he fought a guy who was 4 and 0. Prior to that, he fought a guy who was 3 and 7. Prior to that, he fought Desmond Nicholson, who we all know is a very good fighter, 18, 3, and 1, got beat and stopped in six rounds. So he got stopped in six rounds by Desmond Nicholson, right? And Desmond Nicholson is a good fighter, but you're going to have to go down far on this list to find Desmond Nicholson's name because he is, at best, a top 50 type of fighter, right? So this gives you some indication of the level of opposition that Vozdik has been in with. Very weak opposition. The kind of guys that he should be beating easily. But this is not what's going to prepare him for stepping in to face a guy who's young and prime, physically just as tall and longer than him in David Benavides. But people are okay with this fight. They're hyped about it. They say that this and Tank Davis on pay-per-view, best fight of the year. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I know that you're a fanboy for Tank Davis, but come on, man. Tank Davis should be fighting Shakur Stevenson or fucking Devin Haney. And then we could talk about this being one of the biggest cards in boxing. David Benavitez should be fighting fucking David Morrell, a real risky opponent, the kind of opponent that really is a true 50-50 fight. I lean towards David Morrell to beat and, and stop David Benavitez, but that's me. You may feel differently. But the reality of the situation is these guys are all very, very excited about talking about how Canelo is ducking David Benavides, yet they're not even mentioning how fucking David Benavides blatantly ducked David Morrell last year and currently all this year. Uh, so Turkey al came out and let it be known what he would like to see. He said that he wants to make a fight between David Benavides and the winner of Bivol and Better BF, which is a great fight, makes tons of sense, right? Because as I just showed you, there's no big name opponents outside of Canelo Alvarez for David Benavides at 168. And he's struggling to make this weight. And there's no big name opponents where you can generate big money at 175. Uh, excuse me, outside of these two world champions, who are going to be fighting in Saudi Arabia for undisputed. Now you beat Vostik, which is a certainty. You stop him, and now people start comparing your performance 
to Arthur Bederbiev's performance when he beat Vostik. Of course, when Bederbiev beat Vostik, Vostik was prime, coming off of a career best victory against Adonis Stevenson to become world champion, was super confident and, and really at the top of the division. You're fighting a guy who's been retired for four years and been in with super low level opponents. It's kind of like Deontay Wilder fighting Tyson Fury, who fought this level of opponents after he came back out of uh, self-imposed retirement. And people act as if Wilder was fighting a legitimate fucking version of Fury. But we know he wasn't because we saw what a legitimate version of Fury did. Knocked him out twice. But the reality is, you know, for me, I think this is the best direction. If he wants a big money fight and you want to potentially move towards a Canelo Alvarez mega fight, you beat the winner of Bivol and Better BF. If you beat them and become the undisputed 175-pound champion, there's a 100% certainty that Turkey Alishik will then make a fight between you and Canelo Alvarez for undisputed light heavyweight world title. Because at that point, now you have something to offer. Now you're an undisputed champion. You would ultimately become a pound for pound top 10 fighter if you beat the winner of Bivol and Better Biev as well, because both of them are considered pound for pound opponents, whereas you're not. So really, this is the kind of direction you should move. And if I was him, I would phone Turkey Alashik and say, you got a deal, man. Just send me the contract. I'm all over that shit. I'll fight the winner anytime you tell me to. Let me know. I'm there. I already bought my plane ticket to fucking Saudi Arabia. I got my hotel booked. I'm set. Let's do this. Right? That's a no-brainer. You know you're going to get paid and treated very fair by the Saudis. Example, look at Deontay Wilder as the perfect example. Wilder was given what really was seen as a beatable opponent in Parker, a guy who had lost multiple fights recently, uh, had gotten knocked out by Joy jo jo Joyce, a hard punching but limited fighter. A guy that, you know, while a good fighter, never seemed to have other gears that he could go to, which ultimately is why he lost his big fights. So you got that fight knowing that if you beat this guy, now you're going to get this mega fight with AJ. Right. And you go in there and you fucking shit your drawers in, in probably the worst performance of your career. A fight that was totally garbage. And in that sense, you would think the Saudi Arabians would say, like, fuck that dude, man. He came for a paycheck. He did not even come to try to win. So we're not going to work with him again. It's a waste of our time. But that's not what they're doing. What did they do? Tony Parker ended up getting another big fight, showing they appreciate his performance against you, against obviously Jang, <coughs> who was coming off of career-defining victories against Joe Joyce. Parker went in there, looked like he was going to get knocked out inside three rounds, but rallied and, and did the same thing to Jang that he did to Wilder. Now putting himself right up there in the upper echelon with Fury, AJ, Usyk, and Parker. Really, they are the top four heavyweights in boxing right now. And I think people would have a hard time not putting them all in the top five. I don't know who the number fifth guy would be, but you can let me know in the comment section below. So now, of course, Wilder's getting an opportunity to fight Jang, another big money fight, which could redeem everything. He's fighting a far more flat-footed, limited fighter, slow and a guy that should be much easier than a very mobile Parker. And if he beats him, you know the potential for an AJ fucking huge fight once again falls into his lap. So the Saudis are giving them opportunities. Even if you lose, we're still going to give you another opportunity because, you know, that's the way they do, they're doing business. They're not taking advantage of people and then just throwing them in the trash when they're done. So it's good business. And as far as these fighters that are going over to Saudi Arabia, they should feel that they're being well treated because Wilder now is getting a big money fight against Jang 
in a fight that he should be able to win. And if he wins, it's going to guarantee him an Anthony Joshua big money fight. Guarantee him. Because we know if he knocks him out impressively, the fight between him and AJ is back on the fucking table. Right? So now you go from getting beat in a fight that could have just sent you into retirement to getting three fights, all big money fights from Saudi Arabia. Basically changing your financial profile in three fights in Saudi Arabia. He's probably going to make more money in those three fights than he's made in his whole career beforehand, right? And this is all obviously when he's past his best and mostly just relying on his name recognition. And this is what obviously the offer that Turk Ali Sheik is giving David Benavides. You fight the winner. If you beat the winner, then we can make the Canelo fight. If you lose, don't worry. I'll still throw you more fights. You can see how I've treated other fighters in the past, right? So I, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, I think Benavides should fucking agree to that fight right away because it, it's a great fight. But the question is, is he interested in making great fights or is he just trying to feast on smaller opponents that he thinks he has an advantage against all for a big money fight? Because he wasn't excited to fight Benav uh, Morel. And he doesn't seem excited to fight the winner of Bivol and Better BF. But he wants to fight the small Canelo Alvarez. So, do you want to see David take on the winner? I think it'd be a great fight. I mean, this fight between Better BF and Bivol, I'm so happy the Saudi Arabians forked up the money to make this fight. It's a fight you and I have been asking for for a long time. It's finally a done deal. This June, huge fight. Huge fight. And it's going to be a great a great card as well, right? I know these American YouTubers that are all over the PBC pay-per-views that we're getting, right? They're dismissing and downplaying. And, and have you seen the commercials for these fucking fights? Just the commercials alone that they've been producing are unreal. 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 Yet somehow the American boxing community has ignored all of it. Why? Well, because it's nothing to do with America. Nothing to do with the PBC, nothing to do with Al Heyman. So they'd rather just ignore it completely because that's the kind of hardcore boxing fans they are. It's ridiculous. And when there was talk about Tank Davis and Haney going to Saudi Arabia to make a huge fight, these guys were against it. They're against it. How can you be against one of the biggest fights in boxing? The only reason this fight's not going to happen is because of the same old American bullshit that stop so many fights from happening and force us to wait five, fucking six, seven, eight years for fights to finally get done. So these guys would rather literally wait until Tank Davis was fucking 34 years old, 35, and Devin Haney was like 29 and have the fight happen then when, you know, it happens at welterweight, <laughs> right? Like literally, that's the mentality these people bring to the sport. They don't really want the best to fight the best because if they did, they would be eager to have Tank Davis and Haney go to Saudi Arabia, get career high paydays to make the fight that boxing fans have wanted. Right? For me, I think better be if, or sorry, Benavides would be stupid to walk away from an opportunity to face the winner. We know. He's going to be mandatory for the winner of this fight by beating Bo's dick. The same way he's mandatory, excuse me, for Canelo Alvarez now. The difference in this case is Turkey Alashik has told you that if you want the winner, I will make that fight. The only problem he's going to have is that the fight won't be on fucking Amazon. It'll probably be on zone. But if you want to make big money and you want fights to happen, then that shouldn't be an issue. Especially as Ring IQ pointed out yesterday or the day before, David Benavides' three-fight deal with the PBC is done after this Volstick fight. He's going to be a free agent, meaning that he can take one-off fights. He can go to Saudi Arabia for one fight against the winner of this. Right? And then potentially 
have a rematch written to it or whatever the scenario may be, or, or then agree to fight Canelo Alvarez for undisputed at 175, right? Your options are limitless. And the money potentially you can make is fucking career defining. Money that at no point in David Benavides's career was ever really feasible. Not until Canelo moved into the weight division and not now until the Saudis uh, started showing that they're interested in putting on real boxing events. So as a guy like David Benavidez, now is the time. Now is the time. You, you jump on the opportunity now because this opportunity is never going to happen again. Or at least not for potentially a long time. As far as Canelo Alvarez, we know that apparently the fight that Turkey Alashik wants to make is a fight between him and Bud Crawford, which I understand Bud Crawford fans not wanting to see Bud jump all the way from 175, sorry, 147 to 168. I get it, right? I understand completely. He doesn't need to do that. But, but if you're getting career life-changing money, which is inevit inevitably what's going to happen. You know, Bud Crawford would be paid far more money in this fight than he was paid to fight Errol Spence by the PBC. And if he, like Floyd Mayweather, is able to beat Canelo Alvarez, this is a hugely significant fight. Bigger than Floyd Mayweather's victory against Canelo Alvarez. For sure. And this is no hate or disdain towards Floyd, but Floyd fought an up-and-coming 24-year-old. Bud Crawford would be fighting a prime 34-year-old and literally going up from 147, even though we know he's bigger than that now, all the way to 168 to become a three-weight undisputed champion. I mean... It's mind-blowing how things change. At one time, to be an undisputed champion boxing was really a rarity, right? When, when obviously, B-Hop did it, and then Taylor beat him to obviously become undisputed after that. And then it was a long time before Bud Crawford finally, thanks to Top Rank and, and Bob Arum, was able to do it at 140. And, and at that point, people were like, wow, yeah. Look how many years it's been since we've had someone do that. And since Bud Crawford kicked open that door, it, we fucking had tons of undisputed champions kicking down the doors to boxing, really giving boxing a bit of a renaissance right now, like we've never had before, right? Anui, Usyk, Charlo, Haney, fucking Taylor. Uh, I mean undisputed fighter after undisputed fighter after undisputed fighter. Crawford then does something that only female boxers had done, become undisputed in two weight divisions. So then Anui ends up doing that. And now Yusik is on the verge of doing that if he's able to beat Fury. So we could have two, or sorry, three, two weight undisputed champions in boxing. Like that. Something that it was amazing to have a one-weight world champion be undisputed. But now we could have three of them that are three uh, two-weight world champions. And for Bud Crawford to go up and beat an undisputed champion in Canelo Alvarez, to become a three-weight undisputed champion and a four-weight fighter, not only would he be solidifying himself as pound-for-pound pound number one <laughs> easily, because what a fucking statement that is. For a newie, he'd need to jump up to maybe 135 to fight Tank Davis for something similar, right? Obviously, more weight classes, but but it wouldn't be for undisputed. But obviously, there'd be huge significance behind that kind of jump up. It would be huge. That's what Canelo Alvarez and Bud Crawford would be for Bud. And, and talking about the best fighter of his generation, people would literally say he may be better than Floyd Mayweather. Flow moles won't like it, and they will kick back. But him doing something like that, something Floyd Mayweather has never dreamed about doing. But let me know what you think in the comment section below.
do you think Bud Crawford, Canelo Alvarez needs to happen? As I said, I, I mean, if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to hate on Bud or, or Canelo Alvarez. But at the same time, if this fight gets done, I see the significance. I see that this is one of those fights that for both of them, it's hard to pass up because the money would be so big, especially now if the Saudi Arabians are behind it and ready to push it. Then Canelo Alvarez just might get his $150, $200 million. And as he said before, it's just a lose-lose perspective for me to fight Bud Crawford, but not if you get $200 million. <laughs> not if you get $200 million. Then it's a you-can't-miss opportunity. But let me know what you think in the comment section below. Is David Benavidez going to duck light heavyweight undisputed? And is Turkey Alishik going to make Bud Crawford Canelo Alvarez uh, in September? I hope so, in truth. Uh, I mean, not that I don't want Canelo to fight Benavides, but uh, I think Benavides taking on the winner of Bivol Better Biev is a much better fight, right? And, and makes more sense. Like Turkey Alishik said, we know that Canelo Alvarez is not a legitimate 168 pound fighter. He'd be giving up tons of size to David Benavides. But better be Evan Bivol, they're the same size as he is. And that's also for Undisputed. For Floyd Mayweather versus Canelo, Floyd's giving up weight, but he's got speed, foot speed, hand speed, reach advantage. He's still got a lot of things in his camp that give him a, a potential edge to Canelo Alvarez, as well as his versatility, the fact that he can fight out of the southpaw stance and the orthodox stance showing Canelo Alvarez some very different looks in the ring. We also know that Canelo is not a volume puncher. He's not a guy that's going to uh, cut off the ring and, and trap you because he just doesn't fight at that pace. So it's a winnable fight for Floyd Mayweather. Uh, sorry, for Bud Crawford. Uh, and, and that's one reason why I wouldn't mind seeing that fight because I think Floyd, oh, sorry, Bud Crawford beats Canelo Alvarez. But let me know what you think. Leave it in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Peace out. Enjoy your weekend or what's left of it. And remember, if you're a basketball fan, jump onto my basketball channel on YouTube, Sean on Ball. Uh, we're talking a lot about the NCAA. I put up my whole bracket uh, breakdown. Uh, and uh, outside of Kentucky, I'm not doing bad, but the Kentucky one really uh, was a kick in the nuts. <laughs> but, you know. That's the way NCA March Madness is, man. I did a pool with my coworkers, and generally, lots of people aren't big basketball fans. I work with many people from South Africa, and obviously, they don't watch basketball. And they're like, "I don't watch basketball." I'm like, "It doesn't matter. It's a crapshoot. Random. You know who's favored based on numbers. There's tons of upsets. Anything can happen. Right? Literally, anything can happen." And it's happening. We'll see if Purdue can get out, uh, get through tomorrow's game, which is also potentially a, a, banana, a banana peel. But thanks for watching. Remember to uh, jump in, say hello, like, subscribe, and share.